Okay. Okay. Um, so now we're live on the internet um, officially. Okay, so first off, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm very happy and relieved to be drawing the uh, eighth annual Week for World Parliament to a close. This is sort of the, the final event, uh, at least in my schedule. Um, this year, organizers around the world have planned and implemented a diverse range of in-person and online events to spread awareness and build support for a world parliament now. Uh, we had events on every populated continent from Ohio to Japan and from Buenos Aires to Berlin. Uh, outstanding events include the Model World Parliament organized by the Young World Federalist Associate Chapter in India, the Global Federal League, and a three-day seminar on world federalism organized by Young World Federalist East Africa and Democracy Without Borders Kenya. Those events uh, drew in um, many young people uh, and got them interested in the idea, and I was very proud to see the, the hard work of the organizers pay off. Um, most of the event recordings will be posted on the Week for World Parliament website, uh, worldparliamentnow.org, uh, by the end of the weekend. Uh, additionally, an open letter for World Parliament was signed by over 200 individuals and organizations, including several Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion national sections, civil society groups, prominent NGOs, academics, and of course, many World Federalists. Uh, if you haven't yet, you can still sign the open letter on the website, worldparliamentnow.org. Um, yeah, it's, it'll be available there. And there's also uh, an overview of the signatories posted on the Young World Federalist website, which I will share in the chat. Um, the theme of this year's We for World Parliament is share the vaccines and is focused on highlighting the need for accountable and participatory global governance to more equitably distribute the COVID-19 vaccines. For this debate, we are discussing not only how to develop a world parliament, uh, but also how it would help address global challenges like pandemics and vaccine distribution. This debate will follow the following guidelines to ensure everyone has the right to speak and present their views and prevent people from speaking out of turn. Uh, it's structured in roughly two 60 minute rounds. The first round will be 10 minute speaking times uh, with no interruption from anyone. Anyone who wants to speak for 10 minutes during the first round can raise their digital hand by clicking the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Additionally, you may write in the chat to indicate that you would like to speak before moving on to the next round. I will ask if anyone else would like to speak, which will provide a space for everyone. And I'll get my paper ready here to keep a speaker's list going. Um, the second round is for open discussion and or rebuttals. So each speaker has four uninterrupted minutes to respond to something or present an additional viewpoint. People who interrupt or speak, uh, essentially speaking without raising the digital hand or typing in the chat that they would like to speak or, or use uh, ad hominems will get one warning before removal from the call. Donna Park from Citizens for Global Solutions has graciously offered to keep time. Donna will hold up her phone or, and or gently remind you of your remaining speaking time. There it is, yeah, that's an example. Uh, so keep an eye on Donna when you are speaking. She's also, also co-host, uh, so she can kick you out if, if you piss her off. Um, our first speaker on the list is Rasmus Tenbergen. Tenbergen from the World Parliament Experiment and Democracy Without Borders, uh, and is followed by Keith Best from the World Federalist Movement and John, John Vlasto from Democracy Without Borders. Again, please raise your digital hand uh, if you would like to be added to the speakers list. Are there any questions about the format or the topic of debate before we get into it? Oh, yes, Donna. I just have a question about uh, letting the 10 minute speaker know when their time is up. Would you like me to let them know like when they have two minutes left so they can, is that reasonable? 
Yeah, I think that's good. I think I think a, a, then, a reminder. Yeah. Okay, so I will I will hold up my phone when you have two minutes left, and then again when your time is up, I'll say Perfect. something. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, okay. Uh, if there's no further questions or concerns, I will turn the floor over to Rasmus. Okay, thank you very much. Aston, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. I would like to speak uh, on the topic that you proposed. How can digital technology help us create a, a global democracy? As you said, my name is Rasmus Stenbergen, and together with Mikael uh, Weidinger, um, uh, I am responsible for the global voting platform of Democracy Without Borders. Uh, and for me, it's a little bit a challenge now. I think I know at least almost all of you, uh, and I, see, I think many of you already know um, the global voting platform of Democracy Without Borders and have seen several introductory uh, sessions, so I don't want to be boring. Uh, on the other hand, I think it could be a good idea to give those who have not yet seen it, because it's in a better test phase and password protected, um, uh, I think it could be a good, a good idea to give you at least a, a quick impression what uh, the global voting platform looks like. Uh, and then I would uh, like to lead it from a more practical uh, show aspect uh, to a more theoretical discussion aspect in which we can um, discuss uh, the theoretical question, how can these digital technologies help us to create a, um, a global democracy? So um, if you uh, agree, I would share my screen now a little bit. So this is the discussion paper we might discuss later. Um, but first, I would like you to show uh, a little bit of the global voting platform of the World Parliament Experiment and Democracy Without Borders. Um, you can vote here on all uh, decisions, uh, almost theoretically on all decisions in the world. We have a web scraping uh, program for the most important uh, discussions that are going on. For example, the United Nations Security Council, they are automatically outlawed and you can vote on them after you go beyond um, the password. If you're interested, we will send you uh, the password for this beta test and we will go public later. And you can create your own uh, initiative. So you can vote on your uh, on international discussions. Um, for example, here from the United Kingdom, something that is discussed in the parliament. You can see the bill. And if you're interested to join in, um, you can uh, vote on, on that. You can say, I want this to become an online vote. Uh, and uh, if there's support, you can basically decide everything, including United Nations Security Council. Everything that is discussed there, you can see, discuss, uh, and vote on it. But you can also create your own proposals um, by creating a proposal. Um, I don't want to give you an example, but uh, I could, for example, uh, write we should vote uh, on the support of the uh, week for World Parliament statement, and then it will be uh, an official statement. And we also have a uh, liquid democracy element, a combination of direct and representative democracy that I can delegate my vote. Um, for example, if I would like to um, delegate uh, decisions in Argentina, uh, I can uh, choose Thomas Molina or uh, someone else uh, and give them my delegation, which leads them to be already some kind of parliamentarians. Here you can see our provisional parliament. Those people are uh, the ones who have the most uh, delegations um, and uh, they form a separate group. So I think um, we can do with this global voting platform a lot um, that uh, we want to do as world federalists already on the Internet. I'm happy to answer questions later, but I think for the moment I leave it there um, as a short
short practical example what we can do, how we can use digital technologies to create global democracy um, and to make the discussion a bit more interesting. I would like to give you a theoretical view also. We have this um, discussion paper by um, uh, Democracy Without Borders um, that I wrote with the help of uh, others called United Humans, Internet Voting for a World Parliament, the Global Cyberspace, and the New World Organization of the Third Generation. Um, and um, this is not official position of Democracy Without Borders, but it is, a, as, as said, it is a discussion paper. And for the short uh, amount of time that we have today, I would like to focus uh, just on one picture and give you an invitation to discuss a few issues that are uh, related to that discussion. There is, of course, a, uh, an overview and a summary, and you're invited to read it. Um, the one thing in the short presentation um, I can give you, I would like to give you today, um, is, um, is this one. Um, which gives you a model how uh, um, the organizers think uh, this global voting platform could work in connection to the real world. Uh, I don't want to explain uh, too much, but you can, I would like to focus your attention on the three main elements here. I hope you can see the, uh, the presentation and also my mouse uh, showing that here are the citizens of the world um, and they um, create constituencies and elect the world parliament, but simultaneously they can also participate in this world parliament experiment, this virtual digital uh, parliament that uh, can adopt vote and lobby the real life institution. This is mainly built uh, according to um, um, who, uh, according to the model of the European Parliament. So we have a World Commission here, similar to the European uh, Commission. We have a ch second chamber, a uh, World Senate, and of course a constitutional uh, court and certain uh, committees. Um, so uh, this could work as an interaction, and we have some of the initiatives. So in a certain way, this would be similar to it uh, could be a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly or another form of World Parliament. You would also have World Citizens Initiative that play into the uh, picture and an interaction with the member states. Since we don't have that much uh, time today, uh, I do not want to go into too much detail here, but just offer this to you as a basis for a potential um, a discussion, and I would like to finish my short presentation with a, a discussion question to all of you, uh, which is, if we do a thought experiment, and if we think, what if uh, really many people would use these digital technologies? If you allow me to be very ambitious here as a thought experiment, what if billions uh, used uh, an experiment like this? Thank you, Donna. Um, um, uh, how much would it help us with our cause? Would it be extremely powerful? Uh, would it not help uh, anything uh, at all? Or is it something in between? And if it is something in between, is it closer to it does not help at all? Or is it closer to uh, we would solve some uh, of the uh, most important questions um, that we have? Okay, this is uh, the contrib contribution that the Global Voting Platform of Democracy uh, would like to give to this question that I was asked to present here. Uh, can uh, digital technologies help uh, create a democracy? And if yes, how? Um, and uh, with this short theoretical uh, input and the... Um, uh, the presentation that we already have an ongoing pilot project to demonstrate uh, the power uh, and the possibilities of this. Uh, I would like to end my presentation and look forward to discussing 
this with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Um, that was very informative and I love the global voting platform. Uh, next on the list is officially Keith Best, but I don't see him in the call. So we'll move on to the next person, which is uh, John Blasto from Democracy Without Borders. Okay, can you hear me? Good, yeah. okay. Uh, looking at the audience here uh, that I see in front of me online, you don't need an introduction to the UMPA proposal. However, um, the Young World Federalists have organized this and will distribute it, and there'll be people hopefully watching this who will have no clue what a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly is. So I will give a very quick introduction um, and then throw a couple of questions out there like Rasmus for debate. Um, and then I may not be able to stay for the full debate tonight, but I'll certainly stay in a little while. So. By way of context, I'm going to COP next week. Um, is that a lights failure here? Yeah, I'm going to COP, which is the Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the big climate conference in Glasgow, Scotland, starting uh, on Monday. So I'm going to that. The reason we're in a climate crisis, as we all know, is that global governance isn't fit for purpose. We don't run the planet very well. Uh, essentially, 193 competing sovereign nations negotiating lowest common denominator compromises in defense of their narrow national interest is a stupid way to make decisions for the good of humanity, which is why the Paris Climate Agreement is toothless and emissions continue to rise. And I think we're probably in agreement on that. We desperately need a body to debate and decide what is best for humanity as a whole, and then legislate a world parliament. However, as we also all know, Russia, China, and the US are not about to agree to a democratic world parliament to which they are answerable. So given this urgent need to unlock collective action on the environment, what might the big powers agree to as a first step? And the proposal for a parliamentary assembly at the United Nations is an attempt to answer exactly that question. It's deliberately designed not to need UN Charter reform or Security Council approval or directly threaten national sovereignty. It would start off simply as an advisory body to the General Assembly. But it would, for the first time, establish a parliamentary body at the heart of the UN. So it would differ from the General Assembly in, in three key ways. First of all, the goal of the debate would be the good of humanity, which isn't the goal of the debate of the General Assembly. That's a bunch of ambassadors defending the national interest. Second, larger populations, countries with larger populations would have more representative, representatives, not in the first instance, one person, one vote, but digressive proportionality, just like the European Parliament. And again, third difference, like Europe, seating and allegiance would be by transnational political party, not by country. So that's three key differences between the UMPA proposal and the General Assembly as it stands. Here are three more key differences between a fully fledged world parliament and the UMPA proposal. First of all, it wouldn't be fully democratic. Parliaments could nominate representatives from amongst themselves to attend rather than holding citizen elections. It wouldn't be one person, one vote because we'd have this digressive proportionality. And crucially, it wouldn't be empowered to legislate or enforce its decisions, which leads some people to say, what's the point? So this UMPA proposal, it's unrealistic and then it differs from the General Assembly and therefore it's new and countries aren't going to like it. And at the same time, it's insufficient in that it differs from a world parliament and it can't actually make decisions and enforce them in the first instance, because the big powers aren't going to sign up to that in the first instance. So the question that the UMPA, UMPA proposal is an answer to is where do we strike the balance between something ambitious and effective and something realistic and achievable so we can actually start this process of reforming global governance? And I'm really looking forward to hearing the debates on this at COP next week, so I know there are some coming up. 
Before I finish then, I'll just chuck in a couple of questions to stimulate debate. And these are not UNPA mainstream proposals, so I'm, I'm going, going off message here. Well, they're, they're questions. Should we start with a body focused on the most pressing issue, namely the environment? And to what extent should democracy be the message? Is that just a non-starter for China? Do we start off trying to run the planet better for people by saying to China, you must become democratic, or by saying to America, you must be run by Trump? I mean, you know, how do we get traction to get started? So I, I don't know the answer to either of those questions. I chuck them out there for the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, let me go back to the full view. Was there anybody else who would like to speak for this first uh, 10 minute uh, round on any of these, on any of the topics presented or anything else? Okay, uh, seeing no interest in speaking for 10 minutes, uh, we can move into the second round of the debate, the shorter speaking time is four minutes for response and rebuttal. Uh, a great time to answer, try to answer some of John's very big questions or comment uh, your love and appreciation for the global voting platform. <laughs> Donna. And I will um, hold up my phone when you have one minute left. So I'll hold it up at the one minute. And then again, at, when it's time's up, I'll say time's up. Okay. And let's, let's give John Blasto applause for not even hitting eight minutes. <laughs> Are there any re responses to anything that people have said? Roger, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that comes to mind, Rasmus, is uh, the uh, World Constitution and Parliament Association is working on uh, the House of Peoples, which uh, will be 1,000 uh, representatives to represent the 7.6 billion people. And like you, they're uh, working on uh, how to uh, use uh, the Internet and computers to uh, be able to do the voting and whatnot. And I'm wondering if you've connected with uh, WCP on that at all to see, to compare notes, because I think technically uh, what you're doing is, is really very relevant uh, to, to, to be able to let uh, the population at large have input, uh, I think is, is very uh, gonna be very helpful. And then ultimately uh, when we get a world parliament, uh, virtue voting and whatnot, probably going to be very, very necessary. <laughs> so that's my question to you, Rasmus. And, and the other thing I'll just throw out um, is uh, the alternative model, of course, that uh, Democratic World Federalists represent and some other organizations like WCPA uh, will be just simply uh, uh, using the uh, U.S. Constitution, how they dumped the Articles of Confederation and substituted a new, a new uh, federal constitution. So our model, of course, is a little different than uh, a democracy without borders, but I think the ultimate goal is the same. Uh if that's everything, I'll, uh, Rasmus, you can, you can definitely respond before we continue. Tad, I see your hand is up, but Rasmus, if you would like to respond, I'll, you can have a few minutes here, or you don't have to if you don't want. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, should be possible now. Um, yeah. uh, I, I thank you for the question, Roger. I think it was a two-part question. Uh, the 
short answer to the first part of the question. Yes, of course, we uh, uh, are in contact and we were in contact already. Uh, uh, this is quite an old initiative already uh, as yours, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and uh, it is a possibility to support uh, uh, models. It, it, you could imagine that the community on the world uh, on the global voting platform uh, supports um, the models that uh, the uh, uh, World Constitution and Parliament Association uh, has created, um, but it is not a constitutional uh, process. You can also very well imagine that the community on the uh, uh, global voting platform um, is in disagreement uh, with the results there or uh, suggests a totally different model. Uh, and I see this as an advantage of the Internet processes, that it allows us to have these very democratic processes, including uh, liquid uh, democracy processes, changing a constitution, for example, um, or uh, basically on the global voting platform, you can change almost anything uh, by a simple proposal if there's enough support uh, for that. Uh, proposal. So we are trying uh, to work together with all the different initiatives in the field, but also in helping uh, to organize the decision-making process and to see uh, what we find out what is, is the best way uh, to create global democracy. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Uh, next on the list is Tad and then John. Thank you, President McKee. Uh, can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Good, thank you. Yeah. Well, so happy to be here with my, uh, my fellow marchers on the, uh, uh, our, our long journey to, uh, to one world. Um, John Blasto, I wanna ask you uh, kind of a, first of all, John Blasto, nice to meet you virtually. I think a couple of years ago, I was in London and Professor Ian Crawford tried to arrange for you and me and he to have a meal together and we didn't pull that off, but let's try that again sometime. Um, I have, as many people on this call know, I'm certainly a supporter of both the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly idea and also of the, our big goal of the constitutional and spiritual unification of humankind. But now John Blasto, I wanna really probe you kind of on a question of political philosophy. Um, one of the key uh, elements you put forth uh, in your presentation was you said, well, gee, the, the UNGA has ambassadors, uh, as does the Security Council, of course, um, who don't represent the interest of the whole. They represent their own national interests, whereas parliamentarians and the UNPA would try to represent the whole collective interest. And while I very much want to believe that that's the case, I, I don't know that it's self-evident that it would be the case. And, 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 I, and I want to just give you two examples and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, we like to, you know, in my own country, the United States, we like to believe that our 535 legislators, 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate, are somehow representing the interest of the whole, but often they don't. They really focus on the interests of the constituents they represent alone. And the best recent, most excruciating example is Joe Manchin. The collective interest of my country and of humanity as a whole is clearly to move away from coal, but the interest of Joe Manchin is to keep coal jobs going in West Virginia, which he represents, and that's a real conflict. And it's not self-evident to me that that would be any different in our UN Parliamentary Assembly or even a real Parliament of Humanity that we hope to establish someday. And I guess the final example I'll give would be maybe a hypothetical example. Let's say there is a parliamentarian from Brazil um, who is maybe closely tied to commercial and development interests down there. And while the interest of the planet as a whole is clearly to stop burning the Amazon, the interest of this parliamentarian might be, gee, we want to keep burning the Amazon because we develop things when we burn the Amazon down and gain wealth. So that is my challenge to you, perhaps a little bit too long winded, but how how can we make that be the case 
conceptually and philosophically that parliamentarians, either in the, the sort of the medium term UNPA or in our longer term real parliament of humanity, do in fact represent the interests, not of parts of humanity, but of humanity as a whole and the planet as a whole. Thank you very much. Yes, John, please respond. Okay, um, so first of all, responding to, well, first of all, Aston, thank you for organizing the debate. And I see CGS are having a similar debate or broader debate at their upcoming event. And then we may soon have a new executive committee for the World Federalist Movement, and we may enter into a theory of change across the whole movement, so we can all spend time debating each other, these issues between each other in great detail for, for some time to come. But Roger, I agree with you that um, we share the same end goal. Uh, we share the view that we need a new constitution for running the planet better. Um, and we have different ways of getting there, and that's all to the good, because who knows how we're actually going to get there. Um, so yeah, I'm, in, I'm in agreement on that completely. Um, Tad, I don't think I've been probed by you before. This is a novel experience. Um, so I guess my answer to the question is that the, for, first of all, at the global level, you know, I don't see democracy being a shining perfection, whereas it's never that at any national level. And you've got the Churchill quote about being democracy being the worst form of government apart from all the other ones we've tried from time to time. So, you know, there'll be all the usual people trying to influence the powerful at the global level, just as there are everywhere else. And all we can do is the best we can do to try to minimize that. And I can certainly see weaknesses in the way the US does that and the UK does that. And it'll be a concern at the global level. And when we write the Earth Constitution, we should bear that in mind and write it carefully. Also, serving the good of the whole. I mean, I guess the whole is made up of all the components. And if the people in Virginia or whatever are going to lose out because coal isn't being mined anymore, well, that's part of the debate. And if it serves the purpose of the whole that an industry needs to be shut down, then the whole should make sure they transfer money to the local area to retrain the people. You know, this is all very theoretical. But um, I don't particularly have a problem with parliamentarians representing the interests of their constituents. That's their job. But the debate of the parliament as a whole is in the common interest. And so if we need to stop extracting oil from the ground, then we need to we need to compensate the people who lose out in the short term through that, and we need to retrain them or whatever it may be. Does that answer your question satisfactorily, or are you going to, uh, you're going to push your probe further? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we want to go back and forth uh, between uh, you two right now, but uh, Tad, if you would like to respond, maybe you can keep it. No, thank you. Thank, no, I think we'll, uh, let, let's continue. Thank you so much, John Blasto. That's thoughtful and expansive regarding future possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Tat. Uh, next on the list is Guido Montani. Um, do you hear me? Yes. No? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I like to uh, to pick up uh, to 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 talk about uh, a question raised by John Vlasto, that is uh, uh, the relationship between the campaign for a, a European, a, a European, a world parliament, and uh, the fact that uh, there is uh, some country like uh, China, which is not a democratic country. So that is, uh, I think, uh, a big issue uh, we should uh, uh, discuss because, uh, of course, uh, a world parliament without China is a, a world parliament against China, if you uh, find it. Uh, and um, in, 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 in this pers perspective, I think that uh, we should uh, try to overcome uh, this uh, uh, problem, uh, to, to overcome uh, this uh, contradiction. Because uh, uh, as a federalist, I like to have a, a, a world parliament with all the people of the world. 
and that is uh, the main target, uh, to come to this uh, situation. Now, if uh, uh, you consider the history of the European integration, uh, the beginning was not uh, a European Parliament elected, but it was uh, the European Coal and Steel Community, which was considered by some people a functional uh, uh, institution, something not uh, very interest, interesting from the political point of view. But uh, uh, the coal and steel community has uh, uh, some federalist, uh, uh, federalist engine inside. Uh, so I think that we should uh, try to see if today there is a, a very big problem like uh, climate change, which is so important in order to uh, create a coalition, a, a, let me say, a global governance, including China, in order to go to create a progress, uh, to manage uh, a progress in order to face the climate change challenge uh, with the United States, Europe, China, India, Brazil, and so on. If we are able to make a proposal in order to go in this direction, I think that we can, uh, uh, you can create a situation in which China is obliged to discuss and to upset cooperation with other countries. Um, that is uh, one of the reasons uh, I propose uh, the, uh, for the, um, to discuss uh, the proposal for the uh, constitution of the Earth. The constitution of the Earth is, uh, of course, uh, a partial solution to global challenge. Yes, uh, I stop here. Uh, if I have time, uh, I explain a little more uh, this proposal. You have one more minute. You can use one more minute if you want. Well, uh, uh, no, only to say that uh, uh, my, in my idea, the Constitution of the Earth is not a Constitution of the United States, uh, of the United States, sorry, of the United Nations. Uh, it's not a, 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 a global reform not a, a radical reform. I think that uh, the United Nations should work as they are, but if we had uh, a common goal in order to uh, face the challenge of the climate change, in order to give uh, to citizens the power to intervene, in order to push forward, like uh, Friday for Future uh, young people, in order to intervene in this kind of problem and so on, so you, uh, have a, you have a link between global challenges, uh, planetary challenges and the uh, individual, because uh, in order to have a push to politics, you have to, uh, to, uh, to have individual making step forward. That's all. Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, next on the list is John and then Donna. Okay, I'll just quickly respond to Guido. First of all, I agree with everything you said. Um, secondly, I've dumped a, uh, a link to the detailed UMPA proposal. You can download it. It's free. Download PDF if anyone's not familiar with it. Deals with a lot of issues like what to do about China and non-democracies. Um, I guess the difference between the history of the formation of the European Parliament and where we are today is, is Europe at least started off democratic. And as Guido points out, if we start off with a League of Democracies here, it's in danger of becoming anti-China or anti-authoritarian states. And if environment is the most urgent issue, we really need everybody on board and we need to find a way to move forwards together. Guido, I'm not sure if you can um, put a link to your 
your world constitution idea into the chat uh, or just email me. But I mean, I, I'm not sure I've read that in detail. Um, I imagine, I mean, I'm looking forward to our theory of change following this debate. It's going to be really interesting to talk all this through. Um, I'm very much in favour that there are many routes to get there, and that's absolutely fine, and it's a strength of ours. We pursue many. How we get traction in the next step, uh, I don't know. And to me, that's the most acute and interesting discussion we need to have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next is Donna, and I don't see anybody after that. So if you're interested in speaking, please raise your digital hand. Uh, Donna? Okay, I set my timer for myself. So um, I thank you, Eston, for organizing this. And thanks to everyone for being here. It's just so wonderful to get together and talk about real issues instead of just organizational stuff. Um, First, I want to explain that the CGS conference coming up, John Blasto alluded to it, um, November 11th to the 13th, um, is we have um, a, the, the lead, what are the leading proponents of each of the five paths to a World Federation speaking about their paths. It is not so much a, a debate as it is hearing about all the paths and then also seeing is there some way to integrate them. Also at that meeting, uh, Bob Flax, our executive director, will be sharing our draft theory of change, which actually kind of says, we don't know exactly how we're gonna get to our ultimate vision. So let's kind of hold them all in our minds. And, um, and, and there are many things that we can all do together to first win the hearts and minds of people and educate them and, and put pressure on politicians and all that stuff even if though we don't know what the final path, the final step will be. So anyway, we look forward to sharing that and getting it still in draft. So we're welcoming input. Um, I do want to say I had a fascinating discussion, very brief with Dina Freeman recently. Um, we are actually talking to her about the wonderful videos she and Odette have created, about 25 videos about World Federation. And in the course of that discussion, she made a brief comment about the topic that Guido raised, the very important topic about China. And she said that her that, that China is not against global democracy, just against national democracy. So, I mean, I think we do have to all sort of, I mean, I did, wasn't able to follow up with Dina to understand more about exactly what she meant and why she knows it. And I look forward to doing that in the future, but. I do think we just have to keep open minds. Uh, you know, we might think that China would be against this, but maybe they're not. Maybe we can move to global democracy. Uh, one of the things that impresses me about Glenn Martin's constitution, I uh, mean, I call it Glenn Martin's, that's the WCP, whatever the right title is, um, is that they sort of, my, my reading of it and understanding is that they say we need to let each country deal with the national things. So we're not going to really interfere. With, the, with how China runs China, other than human rights issues, of course, um, and global environmental ones, global ones that affect the rest of us. But I mean, I think maybe there has to be room to let China be undemocratic at home as long as they'll accept democracy at, at, the, um, at the globe. And I see there's a question for a link to the videos. They're not quite ready yet, but uh, once they're ready, Dina said they'll be widely available to any World Federalist group that wants it. And certainly CGS um, will put them on our website for sure, but they're not ready yet. They're, fin they're all recorded, but they don't, they're not finished. So, um, I think that's all I was gonna say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Uh, next on the list is Roger. Yeah, this is a great discussion. Uh, I'm going to start with Tad Daly, uh, bringing up this problem of uh, really money in politics or the big money and the powerful people uh, ruling the roost. Uh, the uh, Earth Constitution uh, and the Earth Federation people will, will uh, attempt to get money out of politics. So when you're running for office, that uh, you'll have uh, a public way to uh, get things. You won't need to get money from the Bank of America and so on. So, because that's absolutely necessary. I, you know, part of the reason the U.S. isn't really a democracy is because money is the boss. 
Um, China, I think, uh, to me, it's a no brainer. If we're going to have a world federation, a world government, we're going to have to have China uh, and Russia, all countries involved. Uh, and I would say that um, Donna, I think, really is making a good point about this uh, thing of uh, democracy with China, because there is some argument about who's really democratic and who isn't. I mean, I'm one of the biggest criti critics of my own country because I really think the truth is we're an oligarchy and we're not really a democracy in the United States. And uh, for those that are arguing for a community of the democracies, uh, I think that just ends up to divide, uh, divides us. And then the other thing that comes to my mind is in, in a community of nations, does it matter if the nation is a crook? Does it matter if the nation is an outlaw? Uh, to what degree should a nation like that uh, be allowed in a world parliament and in a, in a world government and a world federal government. And by the way, a lot of people don't know the difference between a world government and a world federal government. That's one of the areas we really have to do a lot of education because a lot of good people think uh, they have a stereotype about world government and they don't even know about world federation and the principles of federation. But um, getting back to uh, this business of uh, governments, rogue governments, outlaw governments. It breaks my heart, but DWF News, we talk about it honestly. Uh, we're the, the US is the biggest uh, criminal of all the nations. If you count the dead, the nations that the US has invaded, the nations that we're trying to overthrow because they're socialist, uh, it's, it's, it's shameful. And I don't know if uh, World Federalists as a group want to uh, address this or if we want to pretend that the US is the good guy and that China and Russia are the bad guy. But I submit to you that we're much better off in the big picture of this to just plain tell the truth. There's got to be some room for truth here. Thank you very much, Roger. Next on the list is John Blasto. Oh uh, yeah, I definitely think there should be room for truth. It's a slightly disappointing debate given the amount of consensus, um, which is maybe surprising. <laughs> um, a couple of things I forgot to mention. I mean, one is that this, you know, there is an image of us world federalists being rather abstract. And as Donna said, very nice to talk about something real rather than process. I completely agree with that and internal stuff. I fear there's a certain amount more of that to come, uh, but then we need to be outward looking. We do have a real catalyst um, in the form of the environmental challenges we face. So whether we get our way or not, things are definitely going to change. Uh, so that's encouraging uh, for us. And second thing I was going to mention is the Global Challenges sponsored um, Climate Governance Commission. Not sure if you guys are familiar with that. Maya Groff is convener of that in The Hague. And they're going to be at COP next week. So I'm looking forward to their presentation. There's a lot of people coming around to thinking governance is the heart of the issue here. So we have very fertile ground in which to do our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And yeah, I agree. We, we might have a little bit too much uh, consensus here, uh, which might be leading to a little bit of a, it's not so controversial. We all agree we need a world parliament and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, John, do you want to comment? And then, and then Donna. You're muted, John. Sorry, elementary error. Um, yeah, so I mean, if we if we want more debate, we need to get Chris Hamer on board and his you know NATO-based collection of democracies, or um, or we could debate the nuances of world federalist attitude to the United States. So plenty to disagree about as well, I'm sure. Donna, um, let me set a timer for myself. Um, actually, Chris Hamer has uh, changed his description of his. Uh, NATO-based uh, coalition to just be coalition of democracies. He's taken NATO out of it. He he um, heard enough, I think, at the last Congress maybe to um, <clears throat> change his to recognize that those were not good words. <clears throat> I I did mean to um, address Bob, 
John's question about should we start with a body focused on the environment? And I, we have a board member at CGS, so Veda Maani Ewing, she's a Baha'i, and she has been saying for a while now, we should start with a small focus and show that this can work. Um, and I, I do think it's a good idea. And I, I think that starting with the environment and, and maybe even like the environment in general and or access to water or something, something um, that will cap capture everybody's um, concern is a good idea. I, I also feel like for a long time, at least I know at CGS, we often lead with war and ending the uh, threat of nuclear destruction. And it just feels like, you know, that just welcomes in the deep pockets of the military industrial complex. And it, it just, whenever you go against war, you just, I mean, I don't know, it's hard. So I, I feel like everybody is slowly, everybody but the big fossil fuel companies are, are recognizing the problem and the environment and, and access to water. And sounds like, a, I like that idea, John, wanted to support it. Yeah, John, and before, before John speaks, I just wanna encourage anybody else who hasn't spoken uh, to, uh, to jump in line here. All right, John. If anyone wants to jump in ahead of me, uh, welcome. I was very quick, I was just going to say, if, if it's going to be focused, I would be very strongly inclined to focus on the most pressing issue facing humanity right now, which is climate and bleak environment. Um, I wouldn't choose something arbitrary. That's what we need to address. That's why our minds are being focused. So that's where I would start with a focus. And I should say, I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes. I'm sorry about that. I, I, I have something else coming up uh, at the hour. Okay, Roger. Yeah, um, I guess I better alert you ahead of time. Uh, I guess it's probably already too late. Uh, the Center for UN Constitutional Research and uh, DWF, uh, uh, our attendance at this uh, climate change thing. And yes, climate change will be uh, part of the focus. However, uh, we're bringing in the point that uh, we, we also have to be able to eliminate war and nuclear weapons. And uh, part of the problem with war is like the Pentagon and NATO are, the, are some of the largest polluters in the world. So uh, that has to be addressed. This gets back to this business of telling the truth. And the other thing that uh, at the climate change will be brought up is the need, of course, for system change. But uh, because we still allow these wars or even encourage these wars, because uh, I, gu I guess we're in the war business, uh, countries that are worried that are in war or worried about war uh, cannot really deal with climate change because their resources get pointed towards uh, the threat of war or war itself. So in the Middle East, I mean, they're not gonna be able to do much about climate change because they're gonna to have to get the oil to have some money to rebuild Iraq and Iran and so on and Syria. Uh, so I don't think it's really a wise idea to leave out war and nuclear weapons into this discussion. In fact, DWF, our main, every proposal you make, we ask ourselves, can it eliminate war? And can it eliminate nuclear weapons? If it can't do that, we're not interested. Thank you, Roger. Okay, so we have Tom, Daniel, and then Guido. Tom? Uh, I've, I've heard uh, about, about two or three decades ago of a friend of mine who lived in Switzerland, and he said every two weeks, citizens went to vote on national things within Switzerland. I haven't verified that that's my understanding is right, but if it is, we ought to investigate how that would, that would be an example of direct democracy uh, running, uh, running Switzerland. Does anyone know whether that is the way Switzerland does really work? Because if it does, we ought to learn how that has been had done and how it, and how it works and, and get learn from it because we ought to then be trying to do that for the, for the world with these, uh, this, uh, <clears throat> 
a digital platform that we're talking about. Uh, that's the end of my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, uh, I can answer this because I just voted for uh, four items in Switzerland. I'm a Swiss national, but I live in Belgium. I'm also Belgium. I think what is very important is patriotism. You see, to love your country, even though sometimes you don't like some things about your country, but uh, we should be positive and not negative. I think this is very important. I'm also a European, a European federalist. I think the idea of a consultative UN parliament first uh, is an idea we should try on European parliaments. I'm trying to do this, you see, with uh, what our think tank in Brussels is doing right now, uh, CONCUR, with its uh, youth climate ambassadors who are at, in Glasgow right now at the youth conference preceding COP26, and they will be at COP26 as well. So, of course, COVID has not helped a lot. And the fact that we are very few also, I, I don't know what is going on in Brussels exactly, but I certainly appreciate what uh, our Italian friends are doing. This is remarkable and the work of um, Mr. Montani or Lucio Levi, the Federalist debate does and so on, very helpful. What uh, Francis Billion is doing also uh, out of Lyon, it is more European Federalist, but he covers also the world Federalist. I think it's very important that we talk to our members of parliament. Um, the president of my city council is with the Greens, but he's also a member of the federal parliament in foreign affairs. So I keep him informed, you see, about the idea of a, and what we should do at COP26, what Belgium should do. The problem with Belgium is that we have four ministers for each region of Belgium who are in charge of preparing a policy. They should agree between themselves for Belgium at COP26. But th that is very important to see that this message that global democracy is needed, even if it is consultative in the beginning, like the uh, European uh, Parliament was. And at the European Parliament, there are also uh, a few parliamentarians who are active with the parliamentarians for global action. And in all your countries, they are also very active. So these are a few suggestions I would like to share with you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Guido and then John. Um, well, um, um, I like to, to talk about the problem uh, of uh, uh, war, atomic uh, bomb, uh, and uh, the danger of uh, this uh, for humanity. Uh, if you consider uh, the two, uh, I think that uh, humanity today should face two big uh, existential problems. One is uh, uh, an atomic war. The second one is uh, climate change. Uh, I, 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 I wish to, to be uh, quick. Uh, there are two problems uh, of security. But if you talk with, uh, I had a debate with some Af African friends, uh, Vanessa Mukete from Fridays for Future. For these young people, the real danger for their life is climate change, not the atomic bomb. So consider this fact, you can die 
because uh, you can uh, you are a victim of a bomb or something of a of, of, of an army against you but uh, you can die also for climate change and i think that in europe people is dying for climate change today even in the united states in australia and so on the, uh, you should consider two uh, different uh, 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 different uh, uh, evolution of this kind of problem, uh, different uh, uh, character of this kind of problem. Uh, a war can be decided by men. Climate change is not a power. Uh, a, a government of a group of government can, can uh, stop today. So it is uh, like a clock bomb. I don't know if uh, the, te the terminology is correct. A clock, a clock, a clock uh, which uh, every day you are uh, increasing the danger for humanity. So every, every day, every year, uh, uh, is lost in order to stop this kind of danger. So I think that uh, we should consider that uh, you should face the two dangers for humanity. But uh, today I think it is much more important to, find, to fight uh, against uh, climate change. Thank you, Guido. Thank you very much. Uh, John? Yeah, uh, thank you, Guido. I, I agree again. The the English phrase is time bomb, a time bomb. Uh, on Swiss referendums, um, I, I was actually uh, at university doing a very mature master's um, when we had the Brexit referendum and I was sitting next to a Swiss student and the Swiss student said to me, it was very evident that the British had no idea how to run a referendum. So, so be careful how you run them would be my advice on referendums. And, and tied into that, at the global level, I don't think that's where we should be doing the cutting edge experiments on democracy. Um, you know, if we had a world federation, then democratic experiments could happen all over the place. And then the most successful should filter their way up to the top. But um, starting at the top would be a dangerous approach to global democracy, in my opinion. Um, final thing I'd like to say is I'm really looking forward to continuing this debate with everyone, because I think this sort of process is going to be institutionalized and we will look not just to debate with each other but actually to move it forward to decisions on what we're going to advocate and take action on so i'm really looking forward to that process and with that i'm sorry but i i have to leave and thank you very much Eston, for organizing of course thank you very much for being here john see you later okay next on the list is tom and then nicola and then tad uh, in the discussion uh, today, uh, the uh, question of uh, political uh, parties uh, was raised, and I suddenly, suddenly say, is there any way we could have a global democracy without ha having political parties, or is that inevitable and we need to uh, plan for that in in a, if we had a, <clears throat> a global democracy on, uh, online and everyone's voting on uh, uh, all, all the questions that <clears throat> need to be decided. Although I do, I do like this idea of just doing the global democracy on just climate change. That seems like a really new idea to me anyway. And that sounds like a, a great way to bite off <clears throat> in a different dimension, uh, a really important chunk of uh, the crises we face, just focusing on, on climate change with a world democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Nicola? Okay, thank you, Aston and Donat, who have been organizing this meeting. I find found it very useful. Um, Concerning the, the, the speaker of today, I agree with um, John Vlasto and also with Guido Montani, uh, especially when uh, they say that uh, we have to focus our attention 
towards the climate change movements. Uh, next COP26 uh, will be an extraordinary occasion for the Federalist movement to raise attention uh, for our proposals. Uh, every citizen in the world understand that uh, 200 uh, nation states are not able to, to, solve, uh, to solve the climate change issues. Uh, everyone understands that we need to rule, to, go, to govern the issue. So uh, our proposal uh, for a world parliament is well, it could be well understood. We have to insist to, to confront with this movement. Uh, some federalists inside this group have already begun to, to, to speak, to, to work with the Fridays for Future movements. Uh, for example, with Guido Montani and Lucio Levi, we organized a meeting in June with uh, some representative of uh, the Fridays for Future movement. And we found that they are open to our, uh, to our proposals. So I think we have to continue this discussion with them. And uh, I found uh, they, are, they, are, they have a lot of energy. They can uh, help us in order to, to overcome the the resistance of national governments to build a global democracy. So what I suggest, uh, there are also other groups that will be in a COP26 meeting. We have to work together and try to organize a global meeting with uh, Fridays for Future exponents and uh, leaders, because uh, I think we can build something together, some uh, a campaign uh, for a global democracy with the focus of a world parliament, but together with uh, the Fridays for Future, not only the World Fairness Movement. I think uh, this is the right moment to enlarge our support, the, the support for our, uh, for our uh, campaigns. Um, okay. Finished. Thank you, Nicola. Tat. Thank you, President McKeague. Um, so I made a, a kind of a big substantive comment uh, as my first comment, uh, even a question of political philosophy. Um, and now I want to ask a question that's much more focused on movement building. Um, and first, I, I want to say, Eston, uh, both thank you for organizing this and thank you for this format which I think is both uh, creative and effective. And as I heard uh, my longtime colleague and collaborator, Donna Park said, isn't it great to have kind of a real substantive conversation about our issues and our vision, you know, rather than just talking about administrative and organizational stuff. With all that preamble, now I have a question about not organizational stuff, but movement building. And Eston is kind of a delicate question, but since we're all really interested in sort of moving this forward and making this happen and expanding our universe of enthusiasts. Uh, I wanna ask the question, which is this. I am curious, um, this is a Young World Federalist event, and yet most of the people I see on here uh, today are closer to my age than they are to yours. I'm going to admit that I'm a little disappointed about that and curious about that. And I just wonder if you wanna say something about that. Because we all hope that there are going to be legions and legions of people closer to your age than mine. Uh, who are uh, attacking the ramparts on our journey to one world. So thanks for letting me pose that, Eston. Yeah, I'd love to answer that. Um, so basically this, this is the second in a, in a series, I guess, of debates, and it was motivated uh, by my desire to unclutter my inbox. Um, there was a discussion about the Union of Democracies taking place uh, two months ago, and I it quickly blew up to about 75 emails in my inbox between all many people here sending each other one sentence or you know three sentences in reply. Anyway, it was quite annoying. And so I just said, uh, why don't we have a discussion? Uh, the people sending those emails were largely on the, the, the World Federalist Movement listserv. Uh, so the organizations represented here are largely uh, members of the, of the movement. Uh, I also recognize the lack of young people. There's people, there's some young world federalists watching this on YouTube and they mentioned it in the Discord server and how funny it was that I was like the only person 
under the age of 50 in the call. So they are watching and laughing about that. Um, I think it's a, definitely an issue to be um, addressed. We could think about, uh, definitely, I, I will do better at um, inviting the young people to come on here and make it sort of an intergenerational uh, conversation uh, for the next round. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers just sort of where the inception of this came from. It was never, it was more of, yes, the Iron World Federalists are organizing it, but it's, uh, we're organizing it for the members of the movement, the organizations of the movement, which just happened to be you all, you lovely people. Um, so yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll do our best to, to invite some young people. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just say to all these young people watching at this very instant on YouTube, do a little bit less watching and a little bit more uh, participating. We, we need you all in the arena, please. Yeah, I agree. Um, if there's no further comments, I'll, I'll summarize a little bit and then uh, move on to closing the event. Um, I think it was pretty obvious early on that we all agreed that we need a, a world parliament. Um, most of the discussion centered on what would it be for and what issue uh, we should uh, tackle first or what issue the world parliament should tackle first or sort of global democracy in general. Um, and, and as well, uh, how would it, what would the format be? Would this be online or parliamentary or direct democracy? Um, which is a, a lovely debate to have, uh, what exactly would global democracy look like? Um, as John said a couple of times, I believe the World Federalist Movement uh, shall or should, uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain if it's formalized in any way, but it's at least in the air, uh, that they'll institute um, a theory of change process for all of us, where we can sit down and sort of chart out all these ideas, specifically strategy, what are the next steps we can take we all agree on the end goal. There's many different pathways to get there. Um, so we need to sort of figure out uh, how we can best pool our resources and, and, uh, and take the steps necessary to achieve democratic world federation. Um, so that's just sort of, uh, so I'll keep an eye out for, I guess, emails after the WFM Congress about a theory of change process um, in which we can all sit down and uh, figure out the, the right, the next steps for the movement. Um, I just wanted to give a special thanks to Rasmus and John uh, for presenting their ideas at the start for, for, all the, uh, for us to, to, to talk about and for all the participants who spoke today. Um, for your information, the Young World Federalists do have a few more events coming up. Uh, myself and a fellow board member, member will be in Glasgow um, pretty soon. I leave next week early. Uh, for the climate meetings for COP26. And simultaneously, we'll be hosting two live streams as part of our global assembly. Um, so there'll be some events um, uh, that you can watch on, on the YouTube for that. The first is on November 6th with Professor Shimri Zamoretz from the University of Michigan on nonviolent resistance for world federalist activism. Uh, that's gonna have a little bit of stuff from his upcoming book. So the live stream will actually not the video will not be on YouTube for more than like three days because the content is from a new book. So it's kind of a scarcity thing. You have to, you have to watch it or, or it's before it goes away. Uh, the next one is with Andreas Bommel, Sobeda Maani, and, uh, and Tim Mariti on the Pathways for World Federation, very similar to CGS's upcoming conference. Um, we're also planning a, a side event uh, on the Summit of Democracies. Uh, to discuss the viability and ethics of an integration of democracies um, and the role that online global democracy can play in overcoming geopolitical divides. Um, okay, very, I know I'm talking a lot, a lot of information here. Um, most importantly, lastly, the Young World Federalist is uh, currently having a membership drive. Uh, we have no age limit on our membership despite the young in our name. Uh, so if you join today, your contribution will be matched by a generous donor. Um, and I can put the link in the chat right now. Uh, so if you like these events and want to see more events like this, in particular, um, if, ideally with some more young people in the future, great criticism from Tad. I will definitely take that into consideration. Um, I encourage you to join as a mem member or make a one-time or recurring 
donation. And you can do any of those things with the links in the chat. Um, so with that, I thank you so much uh, for your participation and I wish you a good morning, good evening and good night. Thank you so much, Estin. Thanks everyone. <laughs>